As a first year medical student, I will make a mistake. It's going to happen. Wrong site surgeries, medication errors, deaths. Incredible rates of burnout, which is not good for physicians, it's not good for patients, it's not good for our healthcare system. And it's something that really needs to be addressed. So my worst day of residency, and you were just too run down and tired to care. And I think that is when medicine is dangerous. 400,000 patients die each year from preventable medical harm. Yet medical education was doing nothing about it. I really believe the key to changing the culture of healthcare lies within educating the young. We enter healthcare to heal others, but too many times we cause more harm than good. So I thought before I really started redesigning and building a curriculum around quality and safety, I would go to the literature and see what was published. The unfortunate thing at the time, and it really kind of shocked me, was there were really two papers that had been published in this area. There was nothing out there, so I said, okay, let me reach out to a number of people I've got to know, plus people I don't know, and see if they'd be willing to join me uh, out in Telluride, Colorado. When the idea of holding a round table around patient safety curriculum came to me, the first person I went to was Tim McDonald. I told Tim, I've got this idea, what do you think? And he was all engaged and all excited about it and said, let's do it. So together we ran that first patient safety round table in Telluride. The academy is focused on the young. It's focused on medical students, nursing students, resident physicians the future champions for patient safety. Nothing like that sort of training occurs outside of the academy. And it's a wonderful place to train and prepare these folks who want to be champions to go back to their organizations and plant the seeds for amazing patient safety and quality opportunities. The students and residents that have been coming out here, each year they get better and better as um, the years progress. And I think a lot of that is due to the past alumni who've gone home, back to their home institutions, and really started in a small way to make change through projects or initiatives, joining committees, and the other residents and students see that passion and see that commitment and, and they start asking questions and some of the questions they ask are, tell me about this Telluride Patient Safety Summer Camp and what you did while you were out there. Is it worth it? I met Dave Mayer and Tim McDonald on my first day of medical school. I remember thinking, I, I can't believe that this is, this is novel, um, and I can't believe some of the things that they, they were saying, that this is a new field, that we're just starting to really think about um, quality improvement and medicine and patient safety and, and really sort of uh, formalizing uh, training and education around these topics. It's humbling and it's hard to hear uh, about error and um, leading to death and all those devastating consequences, but um, I think it's so important to hear about that as early as you can because it really changes the way you look at your, uh, your career in this field. I kind of got looped into the Telluride Conference um, from that first day of medical school, hearing Tim and Dave talk. Is known that I wanted to work with the underserved I guess it was never really even a question for me I think one of the challenges of family medicine is that you practice in a lot of different fields some of which you might be more comfortable in than others so my worst day of residency it was just a really awful day. 
um, awful 24 hours to having to take care of women in labor and their children and not having my password to log on to be able to see their strips, <laughs> their labor strips, um, and not knowing where to put orders in and just feeling really awful, feeling like I was in a system that it wasn't just trying to push me to learn, it was pushing me to a place where I felt unsafe and uncomfortable. I felt kind of disconnected from my purpose of why I had gone to medical school, and so Telluride regrounded me in that, that drive that I had. The thing that brought me into medicine, I think, initially, I was always fascinated with like the sciences. I'm a geek. Uh, I enjoy biology and chemistry and physics, and I was always good at that stuff. And so it was, it was natural for me to like try and explore the world of medicine. All right, let's give this a little cut over here. Who wants more pizza? Yeah. Yeah. You want more pizza? Yeah, it, was, uh, it was intern year. It was a case where the patient had um, dressings on both feet. I was on fire. Everything was so perfect until it was time for me to put the tourniquet on the limb. And I put the tourniquet on the wrong limb. And after I did that, it wasn't until the attending walked into the room and I looked. And everyone knows they're right from their left. That's so easy. But I started doing his time out never looked at the consent, never looked at the board. He knew what he was doing. He went in and didn't catch the mistake. I caught it. And I said, we have to stop. I put the tourniquet on the wrong side. And how is it that a surgeon can make this mistake? We were about to do a wrong-sided surgery. I would have been the blame for that. I was a second-year resident. Someone told me about this thing called the Telluride Experience. And I was like, what is that? I had no idea what it was. And then as I dug deeper into it, I was like, wow, this exists? I have to be part of this. We've learned a lot in how to put these summer camps on and really perfected the curricula to a point where the students and residents really are engaged 18 hours a day, four and a half days worth of work. And that's a great tribute to all the people, all the faculty who continue to come out here on their own time and their own effort because they believe in the cause of educating the young. It means the world of us to be able to bring in resident physicians, medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, and sometimes law students uh, into this extraordinary place to sit down for four days and really hash out solutions to a lot of the problems that are falling upon healthcare and particularly those that, that involve patient safety. It's kind of neat listening to everybody behind us having those great conversations yeah. and um, with a group of people who until two and a half days ago had no idea who each other was and it just warms our hearts to listen to those conversations going on as they talk about the importance of this week and what it'll mean to them even 10 years from now but I know your view Dave is kind of probably the same you know the networking and the relationships that are built out here by students, as Tim pointed out, that didn't know each other, didn't even know a whole lot about their schools that these other students went to. And in a matter of two days, they're totally engaged, they're talking about ideas, they're sharing thoughts. One of the probably best things I've seen. That I was that. so excited when I was accepted. I didn't quite know what the experience was gonna be like until I got there. And it was just every minute of, I was just surrounded by great people from all over the country. 
for many hospital administrators, and it's 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 you see more and more chief experience officers type of thing, but it's this confusion that um, the patient experience is all the soft, fluffy stuff. No, right. in fact, improving the patient experience is safe, high quality, patient and provider centric. It, it's, it's how does it make it as easy as possible for you all to be the best use you can be. In turn, you will make it a stellar experience. Whether you have a large TV, a waterfall and a fireplace in your lobby, ain't kind of here or there. One of the things that I liked about Telluride was the different ways that we thought about communication and teamwork, but we also played games such as the teeter-totter, and that was really fun um, because it was putting theory to practice in a lot of ways. Now the two of you, you in the middle, you're yeah. both going to step back with your left foot first, about an inch, right? Ready? On three. One, two, three. I've learned through the years that if we don't include the patient and family voice in anything we're doing around quality and safety, be it education or care at the bedside, we're not going to get to where we need to go, and that's zero preventable harm. And I learned that a number of ways, but the one thing that goes back in, in my mind is um, Helen Haskell and the story of her son, Louis Blackman, who lost his life due to a series of, of just un very unfortunate, preventable issues that ultimately led to his death. Louis had died five years earlier. What I was trying to do was, you know, was to have it an effect. I was so, we had thought that Lewis was this unique child, that he was really going to make his mark in the world because he was, he was so brilliant and so intuitive and, uh, you know, we thought he was just on a different plane from other, other children, even other people. feel guilty for every breath you take if your child has died. And he said, don't blame yourselves. This is our fault. This is our responsibility. this one now, use the handheld and stuff. Um, so, the, um, thoughts, comments? Um. Just, I think um, one thing that struck me is that no one was really listening to your concerns and that makes me sad because I've seen it. And um, we really need to stop looking at patients and families as the enemies and they're really partners in all this healthcare. And I'm a mom too and I just can't imagine your loss. I'm so sorry that they let you down. They were all absolutely determined that we not speak to the nurses and the residents. I mean, I, I shouldn't even tell you the things I, I thought in response, although I didn't say them. But um, I, I think it was a tremendous disservice to them, and it is a real, um, it's still something that causes me pain. 
we, we have, unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of sad stories, but how do you take these stories to allow them to share their message in a way that it educates us to do better? I think my reaction to this film, if I had seen it uh, before this year, would have been, how could this have possibly have happened? And I think that would be a layperson's reaction to seeing this. And now, being involved in healthcare, I found myself feeling like, yep, I can see exactly how that happened. And, and that's the really scary part of it. I think it's, it bears saying again and again, it is incredibly damaging to people when they are humiliated and treated with disrespect. And in the healthcare environment, it, it, the damage is so, is so profound in that it's not just to us, but to our patients and to the whole environment. So we, we, can't, we can't understate how damaging it is. Um, and therefore, uh, I think it bears saying over and over again. And clearly it's unsafe for our patients. We've talked about this again, but I wanna, I wanna give it another little twist. When people are, are humiliated, or treated in a really outrageously despicable way, the first response, the initial response is psychological. And we have, a, it's a mix of, uh, of emotions and it's very hard to characterize them, but all of these things are part of it. Fear, confusion, frustration, doubt, anger, all of that is there. Uh, and that's perfectly normal, uh, but it's very powerful. As David said, these are very powerful emo emotions. And the important part that I wanna bring up is it really clouds your judgment and thinking. So at that moment, you are at great risk of hurting somebody. I was not in my clinical training yet when I saw those videos. And it was hard to watch a video about so many series of errors that happened um, and then this devastating outcome and not have medicine as an institution knocked down about 10 rungs in my mind. Um, it was, I still think about that. Um, I think that that is when medicine as an institution crumbled. It wasn't a sad thing for the institution to come crumbling down in my mind. I think it was a really positive thing uh, and it set me up for um, being a provider that has a different idea of what medicine looks like. I, th I think those stories really helped me understand um, why that, in, that, that hierarchy isn't effective and why it won't work. Um, and again, having that before my clinical training uh, was, was so eye-opening. One of the stories I'll never forget is Caitlin Farrell, who's one of my heroes. We selected Caitlin. Many years we get more students and residents than we could take, but we take applications and we review their personal letters and their, their CVs to see who really has great leadership qualities and who has that passion for quality and safety. And Caitlin met those. But the first day we were there, our curriculum started on Sunday and it happened to be Father's Day. And we ask all our students and residents at the end of each day to post a reflection, to post some aha moment or something they wanted to share that they felt was important from that day. And that evening, Caitlin posted her story. And she tells the story about how she lost her dad nine years ago to medical error. And she resolved at that time on how they were treated and the lack of transparency and answering questions that she was going into medicine and she was gonna make it better. I started crying when I read that and I still today get choked up. That story, when people read it, was just amazing. And you see her passion, you see her commitment to wanting to make healthcare better. And she came, uh, we loved her interactions, and we stayed friends through the years. And I know she's moved now into her residency, and we continue to have great conversations with her and continue to track how she's doing as she goes through. Mostly it's a personal issue for me. Um, 
My father died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2005, um, and he actually died of a, uh, an infection that he acquired in the hospital, and a lot of errors happened in his care. It was just this huge epiphany. It wasn't just me. There were lots of things that were happening, probably even more grave than the error that I made. It was a near miss, and it was a serious one in my perspective. But it, it definitely empowered me in such a way that it became my goal to never let this happen ever again, not to any of my patients or anyone on our service, but anyone anywhere within MedStar or outside of MedStar. Well, I guess when I told people I was going to tell you right, some of them said, What's, what are you bothering about this quality and safety business for? The first thing I've picked up really is, uh, is what a talented pool of students we've got here. And sometimes I worry about the future of quality and safety and health, but then when I see the future leaders, and these are the future leaders, I've, I'm feeling somewhat reassured. So to bring the Telluride experience to Sydney, uh, meant, uh, meant a lot to me. Uh, I'd, I've been there for, I think, five years in Telluride teaching. So what Kim did after spending a number of years with us is he said, I need to take this back to Australia. I need to go out. I need to find funding support. I need to follow the model that we did here in the States, um, take the curriculum and implement it. They're really life skills. All the stuff we te teach in patient safety are just skills for life. They're great ways to get on with your, your boyfriend and your girlfriend and your partner and your team. A lot of this stuff is just really good. It's good for marriages. So it's, uh, you know, we're teaching you. This is a big agenda. You think, you think, it's, you think it's patient safety, but this is all about, th these, are these are really, really valuable life skills. Like nothing much has changed from what was happening during the day. Like I noticed, there on the Sunday, you know, he'd been tachycardic for hours and hours. And if I come on at night, I might have been like, I'm really worried about this person, but why wasn't anything done during the day? Like it's one o'clock in the morning, surely they knew about it. Surely that's him, they know him better. Maybe I'm just missing something. And yeah, I can totally understand how the politics and the hierarchy really interfere with your ability to communicate with patients sometimes. As you're hearing these discussions, and that's a great comment, think about when you become the senior doctor. Think about when you become the senior nurse, the chief nurse of the unit, the chief nurse officer. The culture and the expectations of what you want to see based on this. Don't just assume those sort of bad role modeling scenarios you know, start thinking about what you would do as a leader in those situations, because that's how it changed. I was just blown away by three things. The beauty of Telluride, the quality of the scholars, and the amazing faculty. And I thought, if we could get a Telluride-like location in Sydney, and I think we've got one here at the Q Station, uh, if we could get some brilliant, amazing young scholars, and we've certainly done that, and, uh, and the American faculty and pair them with Australian faculty, wow. And it worked. It's been good. Ta da! Okay. So. So why did I do that? Not to show you, my, I, not to show you I work out of the gym. Uh, it, it, was, it was because it was a story. If I told you hand washing was important, you'd think, oh yeah, hand washing. But if I, if I took my clothes off to show you how important it was, you'll remember. You'll remember the old guy that took his shirt off. And so the great thing about it is not only do we have three camps in the states where we're putting over 150 future healthcare leaders through our program, we've got two camps internationally, one in Australia, thanks to the leadership and the vision of Kim Oates, and we've got a second camp in Doha, thanks to the leadership and the vision of Tim McDonald. And we're continuing to look at other opportunities to spread the curriculum to more students across the world. A few years ago, I came to Qatar as the chair of anesthesiology and the medical director for quality and safety at the Sidra Medical and Research Center. 
And at that time, I had already been involved in about nine years of the Telluride experience that, that, that involved into the Emerging Leaders for Patient Safety. And always thought it might be really, really cool, it might be really great to begin to work with the people here in Qatar who are very committed to education. The multiplier effect for what you're creating here is absolutely endless. So what I look forward to is in a couple of years reporting back as to how many million flowers bloomed as a result of this experience. From a native guy perspective and from a medical resident perspective, I mean, from cultural point of view, from patient perspective, it could be considered as a weakness. Mm -hmm. It could be, uh, even some resident would consider it as being shameful to ask for help or even ask questions from your senior attending physicians. It was an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I truly got to experience empathy for the first time, I believe, in my life as a healthcare professional. This academy that started in Telluride is now international. It's all over the world. It's the first time it's been in Australia. You know, some of us worry about the future of health, what it's going to be like. But when I see these people, I know the future of health is going to be good. It's been amazing to see what I call the ripple effect of this. Never thought I would envision the magnitude of what has happened with this work. We have over a thousand Telluride alumni scholars. These are future healthcare leaders. Some of them today are already healthcare leaders who have gone out and started changing the world. When you start changing the environment of care and you put people out of their rhythm, uh, strange things can happen or unsafe things can happen. Tim? Yeah, that's a wonderful point. I'll also say that you, know, you brought up adding things to the checklist. Checklist can get very, very robust and complicated and sometimes simplifying is a good idea as well. We have to implement situational awareness and make sure that we're using common sense. So the time right experience, uh, I, I think it affects patients and families because uh, it shows or is, is a vehicle for which we can not be stagnant and we are continually growing and questioning and not being satisfied with the status quo. I think we'd be foolish to think that we sent one or two residents or one or two faculty members to Telluride and therefore our department is now safe. Uh, that We all know that's just not the way it works. So we need this continual learning environment and we need to be able to continue to exchange those, those uh, ideas and stories with others from around the country. I first had the pleasure of working with Nat and really getting to know her first as a physician. Um, late in her intern year, we worked in the hospital together for two weeks. And then she was one of the inaugural pathway residents in quality and safety and health systems. And she really uh, was tasked with hitting the ground running and leading a high profile, large multidisciplinary uh, sepsis improvement project. We were able to positively impact identification and treatment of hospital-acquired sepsis. Um, and beyond that, we also want to highlight some of the novel aspects of our system, which does include a nursing-driven triage step, um, and also the ability to track specifically both nursing and provider response times. She really did this amazingly well and, um, and really uh, took the reins with helping to just drive the project. And some of it hinged upon her background, her knowledge, her strong training in quality and safety methodology to help, um, help really frame the question in the improvement process. Part of it is just her intangible leadership skills and, and, and helping um, move the project forward. There's all these sort of little complex dead ends, you know. I, I think of, at least in the ICU, there's about 180 to 200 decisions and actions every day for a patient. Um, and I think a lot of people don't recognize that and bound to make strange errors with that many decisions. And so working on finding a resident who is adult enough, who has that core knowledge and has sort of worked through that and recognizes the importance of let's study something, let's measure something, let's make a change, let's measure it again, let's make a change, let's involve what I would call boots on the ground, the people that do the job to make that change. I think that's a pretty special thing. And so for me, Having Nat, she had already broken through that. It's as if she was three or four months ahead by having gone through this program.
I come here because I get something at Telluride that I really don't get elsewhere. This interaction with, with people who are concerned about the issues that I'm concerned about um, in a setting that allows um, for contemplation and, um, and rethinking and, and, and sort of um, stimulation and inspiring new ideas and new projects. I mean, a lot of projects have come out of Telluride. A lot, I think a lot of real advances in uh, medical communication have come out of Telluride. The round table or this academy, this hot housing, is just the first part. Once they've finished this, we want them to go back and make a difference. We keep in touch with them. There's an alumni form to keep them together. And this is a growing movement, so for the rest of their lives, they're going to be part of this, this alumni. Uh, we're going to make sure they hang in there and make a difference. And we'll support them, because it's going to be tough and it's going to be lonely. But we want them to make a difference, and we want to help them do it. Dave Mayer, John Steinberg, these are all prominent people. And knowing that the positions that they hold hold influence to propagate change, that's one side of the story that's helpful. But having them as mentors to guide you along the way, to help you with challenges that you may be experiencing in promoting change, implementing uh, cultural shifts, and gaining the acceptance from people that may not see things your way, that's powerful. I think there are a lot of challenges in medicine, um, particularly um, for trainees and for people entering medical school and residencies across the country. Um, and as I'm just about to graduate residency, I think that is really a really important challenge for me at this moment. There's something about training in our current system and growing as a physician in this system that leads to these incredible rates of burnout, which is not good for physicians, it's not good for patients, it's not good for our healthcare system. And it's something that um, really needs to be addressed. Residency is obviously a very intense time commitment, a lot of times, um, and some months are more intense than others. For the most part, I think it, it's a struggle, even if you love what you do and you spend over 80 hours a week doing it, um, it's still a, a physical, mental, emotional struggle. Um, and the first couple months I was pretty engrossed in what I was doing and didn't have a lot of time to exercise. And then I started working out and going to different gyms as I had more time and, and made the time, I guess, um, and just really noticed that I think my optimal level of happiness and resilience comes when I can hit the gym or hit the bag for four to five days out of the week, ideally. You can't yoga your way out of burnout. As much as I love to say, I find balance and exercise and working out. It doesn't change the fact that there's burnout coming at you from multiple different levels. Going to tell your ride definitely helps build resiliency because it gives you this framework of knowing that there are people out there who share the same views that you do and that there are places that are bringing about culture change and making a difference and fighting that fight every day. This week's been special in a lot of ways. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, from my Australian faculty and, and co-organisers and from the American faculty, but I've, I've seen these young people change. I mean, I was we were impressed when we selected them. When we met them, uh, I was pretty amazed and thought, wow, we've selected a good group. But they've changed. Um, they've interacted with each other. Uh, they're coming up with suggestions. They're uh, 
they're making pledges to make a difference, and some of them have said to me, I'll never be the same. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> no, don't film that. <laughs> so 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 I may be an anesthesiologist by training, but I'm really a passionate educator at heart. The Telluride Patient Safety Summer Camp experience was born as a result of caring faculty like Kim Oates, Helen Haskell, and others who have dedicated their careers to educating future caregivers on how to reduce risk to our patients. Today, our Telluride Patient Safety Summer Camps around the world continue to grow an alumni network of young caregivers in search of making healthcare safer. If healthcare is truly going to address the global medical air crisis, we have to educate and empower our young with knowledge and tools to provide safe, high quality patient care. Every year, the amount of students and residents interested in coming out here has grown. And I feel a lot of times so bad because I review every one of those applications and for every one we accept, there's two to four residents and, and students who would love to come out here and we just haven't had the support to bring as many as we could out to Telluride. With your help and support, we could continue this important work and bring more future health professionals to one of our patient safety summer camps. We won't stop our mission of educating the young until healthcare is safe. Losing one life to preventable medical error is wrong. Losing 400,000 lives each year is inexcusable. Join us and be part of the solution.